Right, today we're going to speak on the, well I'm going to speak on the voice of the silence. And the way I'm putting it over today is that it is a manual for self-transformation. That deep contemplative serenity that offers transformation to the aspirant or disciple on the path. A little bit of a story between these two. When, it's, when Neville said that it was from the 80s, that is a book that I had. It's, it's almost falling to bits now. <laughs> the one with the voice of the silence. Uh, it was uh, Dr. Douglas Baker's book from the Arcane School. Obviously, it's Blavatsky wrote this. And the new book that I have, I put that on because I think it's quite a, a really good book. I like this picture and I think it's, I don't know where I got the picture from, but I think it, it covers perfectly the thorny path, you know, the, the straight path and the, the narrow path, you know, the one that up the face of the, the mountain. So from the voice of the silence, and now I see the ever narrowing portals on the hard and thorny way. To Janana, our wisdom. And that was from page 52 of The Voice of the Silence. Silence suggests tranquility or peace. And Sri Ram confirms this when he writes, The sense of peace arises from harmony with the essential nature of things. An inwardly undistorted and beautiful relationship to everybody and everything. Our quest for unfoldment can be understood via the three halls, the two paths, the seven portals, and inner and outer transformation, which is quite a major part of, of what I'm going to talk about today. I was asked to do this talk on the voice of the silence, bearing in mind tranquility and transformation, it is not my intention, therefore, to pick through the text verbatim, as this has already been done before. I actually have done it before, and we do have fair uh, copies on our Facebook site. I do consider the voice of the silence as a deep, meditative serenity that offers transformation to the aspirant or disciple on the path. My objective in this talk is to highlight what I consider to be key points from the text, practical, detailed and constructive objectives, achievable goals through a better understanding of the effectiveness of correct action. The voice of the silence, whence it came and who is it for? The voice of the silence, as HPB or HP Black Blavatsky pointed out, in the course of her literature, was taken from the Book of Golden Precepts. In Eastern mystical tradition, this book was obligatory to their tradition. Many theosophists accepted them. HPB memorized 39 of those precepts and translated them for her students. The works, believed to be translated from various sources, including the Book of Jan, were presented by the Nagas or serpents, another name for the ancient initiates. Further details can be found in the preface to the Voice of the Silence. Those who followed the path of initiation, or who were willing to fast track their spiritual evolution, were prepared to take the thorny path that leads directly up the side of the mountain, much like the picture, the photograph that we saw previously. We established that the Lanus, or disciples, sometimes called Shravakas, are those that follow the occult or esoteric path to enlightenment. When we open to fragment one, we are told that the instructions therein are for those ignorant of the dangers of the lower Idi, which in Sanskrit translates as siddhis, or psychic powers in man. There are two types of siddhis, those at the course more psychic, 
mental energies on the lower moral level, while there are methods for development of the higher levels. For those who surpass the senses, these cities are there to serve. In keeping with the meditative quality, we are introduced to Nada, the voice of the silence, the depth that is reached in meditation through dharana or perfect concentration of the mind upon a specific interior object. The mind, as the raja or king of the senses, is depicted as the slayer of the real. It is the disciple's task to restore this balance. When, through viveka or discrimination, the one can be discerned and the inner sound kills the outer. The commentary gives a detailed description of these faculties. The disciple leads the disciple, oh sorry, the discipline leads the disciple or lanu through the journey of the three halls. The first is the hall of sorrow, avidya or ignorance, where the soul believes it is a separate, it is separate from the one. The traverse the three to traverse the three halls successfully without being bound by temptation and illusion, leads to a fourth and then the seven worlds. The second hall is called the hall of learning and the third the hall of wisdom. The path of perfection begins with the traverse through these halls and we are warned not to be sidelined through any of these. As for the hall of learning, we are warned that the great illusion or demon of illusion in most esoteric, esoteric religions, sorry, in esoteric parlance is personified temptation through men's vices. The fascination exercised by vice upon certain natures. In this arena, we can become like the moth attracted to the flame. In the hall of wisdom, we are told that we would reach the veil of bliss. Our concentration at this point should be the awareness of the heresy of separateness. We realize the point of intuition and the merging with the master's voice. The seven gates are reached once all three halls are complete. We are on the upper rung of the ladder to hear the voice of the inner God. We find the nightingale's sweet voice the silver symbol of the Janis, the melodious tones of the ocean sprite, the chant of the vena or lute, the trumpet blast, the dull rumblings of a thunder cloud. All are swallowed and die, so there are no more sound. This is symbolic of the Lanu merging into the one at the feet of the master. Purification of the body, mind and heart are the first requirements for any distraction will lead you away from your goal. The self of matter and the self of spirit can never meet, but there is that bridge that leads the lower to the higher. Personality but must be crushed out. It is said that thou canst not travel on the path before thou hast become the path itself. Fragment 1 continued. Having subdued the mystic sounds, the mind is steady, and when the heart is pure, eternal life's pure waters, clear and crystal. With the monsoon, tempest's muddy torrents cannot mingle. As I see this, though the lake, though the lake is clear, the demon from its depths it may appear. Be vigilant at all times, as though it may appear that all is well. Suppression of a deep desire or wicked thought can appear in a different mode. The poetic beauty of this work is self-evident, and I would encourage you, if you have not read this work already, to do so. It is not my intention to take you, the ardent seeker, 
through every single page of the Voice of the Silence, but to elaborate on certain aspects that can be gathered from this work. In fragment one, we are directed to the search for truth via discrimination, to know what is sad or truth and what is asad, false or illusion. The words written by H.P. Blavatsky suggest that before the soul can see, the harmony within must be attained and fleshly eyes be rendered blind to all illusion. Before the soul can hear, the image, man, has to become as deaf to roarings as to whispers, to cries of bellowing elephants, as, the, as to the silvery buzzing of the golden firefly. Before the soul can comprehend and may remember, <coughs> she must unto the silent speaker be united. Just as the form to which the clay is modelled is first united with the potter's mind. We are reminded by the above of our dedicated commitment to the daily practice of meditation. There must be an opening of the inner sanctum, a total immersing with the higher self, as said, <coughs> for then the soul will hear and will remember, and then to the inner ear will speak the voice of the silence. The text continues with the soul's turbulent journey through identification with fear, distress and illusion at the world's turmoil. As we saw previously, there are three halls that we must pass through on our evolutionary journey. From a slightly different perspective, the first we are advised, this earth, disciple, is the hall of sorrow, wherein are set along the path of dire probations, traps to ensnare thy ego by the delusion called great heresy. And that was page, of, page 20 from the Voice of the Silence. While the first hall has been described as sorrow stroke ignorance, the second is the hall of learning. In it thy soul will find the blossoms of life, but under every flower a serpent is coiled. Page 21. And moving on to the second fragment, the two paths. The call is to the teacher of compassion. The candidate is knocking for admission, asking of the master to reveal the doctrine of the heart, where truth and sincerity abound, as opposed to the doctrine of the eye, which can be purely intellectual. There are the two paths, three great perfections and six virtues that transform the body into the tree of knowledge. The two schools of the Buddha, the esoteric and the exoteric, are the heart and the eye doctrines. The doctrine of the heart is so named because it emanated from the heart of the Buddha. It is sometimes also called the seal of truth, or the true seal. If during my study of the course of the text I came across a word or something that required further explanation, I duly noted it to be explained during my talk. So the first one was a liar, the root or essence of the universal soul. It is reflected in all, yet fails to reach some men. Having reached a level of perception of existing and non-existing things, and before taking the first step, the lanu, or disciple, is advised to be of clean heart, to discern, moving through maya or illusion, and rising to sat, the one eternal and absolute reality and truth. Who advised this? The diamond soul, supreme Buddha, Lord of all mysteries. Buddha means enlightenment. The mind, like the analogy of the mirror, when it gathers dust, loses its reflection. It is preferred that soul wisdom removes the dust from mind, or from the mind, to blend the mind and soul. Avoid illusion, ignorance and deception. 
don't fully trust your senses. The true man is the reincarnating ego that reaches union with the higher self. It is interesting that we read, false learning is rejected by the wise. The doctrine of the I is for the crowd, the doctrine of the elect. Further notes from the text. The wheel of the good law is calm. Amrita, eternity, the diva egos, the higher self or seventh principle, the essence of the reincarnating egos. The dharma of the I is the non-existing, the dharma of the heart is body, true divine wisdom, what is real, permanent and lasting. The articles of the lower self are not connected to the higher self. And this is Joy Mills, when we're moving into, from inner and outer transformation. And a picture of the Buddha, where the literature is Buddhistic. Joy Mills, from her book, From Inner to Outer Transformation, Chapter 2, Waking Up, page 20, alludes to the two paths of Buddhism when she discusses the nature of the sutras, the direct teachings of the Buddha, when she writes, first there are the sutras, a term which actually means thread, and which may by extension mean brief aphorism, a thread on which one may string thoughts, insights and understandings. She is quite sure that the teachings of the voice of the silence are Buddhistic, as they are more harmonious with the sutras. In contrast, the second type of literature is called the sastras, works which are discursive, logical, commentarial in nature, still of great value because in many cases they were written by those who came in contact with the original interior illumination. In view of the above, the voice of the silence is of a particular quality and as a guide to transformation does not give us long explanations, logical and discursive arguments. It speaks to us directly, awakening in us a new kind of mind, awakening us by a kind of psychological and even spiritual shock treatment. It changes us and calls on aspects of our nature with which we may be may be only vaguely aware. The value of literature is twofold. Joy Mills gives us an account of Thomas Quincy who said, There are two types of literature, the literature of information and the literature of power. The literature of information concerns data, direction, or can contain location as on a map, an average intelligence is able to understand it. I did mention a second type, and the literature of power, on the other hand, is literature that moves an individual. Pythagoras referred to such writings as possessing an energy, a spiritual energy, that could under certain conditions enter into the life of an individual with a transforming effect. Both types are obviously very useful, but the literature of power is that which awakens the depths of our being. As veritable sleepwalkers, we are unaware of our real existence for the, for the best part of our lives. True wisdom comes from within and therefore has to be awakened. There is no longer the mist the obscuration, the clouds. The voice of the silence is literature of power. Many of its passages, aphorisms or verses move us deeply and have the effect of bringing our minds to a condition of interior silence, a condition in which we become fully and totally awake and therefore receptive to the intuition in its truest sense awake to wisdom, to truth, to the reality underlying all existence, 
perceiving existence with an unveiled spiritual perception, to use HPB's words. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, we are led to wisdom through the notion that silence has a voice. In Genesis, light expresses itself through the silent void as vibration, much the same as sound. The Logos in Greek manifests itself through the universe, divine manifestation. From St. John of the Fourth Gospel we learn, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The mystical revelation gives a platform for the deeper emotional process of ever becoming. Silence is that platform. So what is the voice of the silence? And Sri Ram assists our understanding when he quotes from the Way of Wisdom, page 185. The voice of the silence is a mystical phrase having many meanings pertaining to two different levels. We can understand the voice at our level as the voice of buddhi or intuition. Intuition is not just a hunch or a guess. It is a sure understanding, an infallible direction that arises from within. Only when the mind is not confused by thought. The voice of the intuition speaks to us at moments of receptivity. Fragment 3. The Seven Portals Several more words than I noted while working through the text. Achaya, the spiritual guru. Yana. Here we learn of the distinction of the two Buddhist schools. Yana is the vehicle, like the Upadi in Sanskrit. Maha, we already know, as great, and Hina is the lesser. The two schools then are Mahayana and Hinayana. The Lanu, having passed through the halls and reached and reach the seventh portals, is asked to be taught by his guru, the great wisdom. The Srivaka is the one who listens, then the teacher can but point the way. Santan, Tibetan or Jayana, Sanskrit, is a meditation for which there are four degrees. The Lana is asked, which would you choose? The Santan or meditation of the eye doctrine? The fourfold Dhyana or the six parameters? the noble gates of virtue, charity, morality, patience, energy, contemplation and wisdom. There are an additional four for priests. They are right means, science, pious vows and force of purpose. Shadows. The physical bodies are described as shadows in the mystic schools. Julia. I the Chinese name for Buddha. Shangaro, metaphorically, it also kills compassion. Namanakaya, one who has reached Nirvana, but then shuns it, instead to serve humanity. This is the secret path. Tomorrow, in esoteric terms, means the next reincarnation. Reference to no smoke without fire and the karmic progeny of all our former thoughts and deeds. Mara, a demon or azura in exoteric language, whereas in esoteric is temptation through men's vials. We must live as selfless as possible. The selfish devotee lives to no purpose. Prepare then through virtues for the next life. Gain cities for the purpose. Niyama, the sun in Tibetan. Migma as Mars and Lahagpa as Mercury. The text teaches us not only to slay desire but to slay the knowledge of desire. The fourfold Dhyana Winds, wind, sorry, the fourfold Diana winds on uphill. 
This is the simple path to enlightenment that rolls around the mountainside, whereas the path of the six virtues is the narrow straight path. We all, sorry, we are warned, therefore, not to let thy senses make a playground of the mind. The master's soul is a liar, the universal soul or Atman. Again, we read of the sacrifice of the self. This is the small self to the higher self, or described in the voice of the silence as the impersonal self drawn together through the Antakarana, or sometimes called the Rainbow Bridge. The sacred river's roaring voice evidently is used by physics as well as occultism to describe that which has a common tone with nature. The coming together of rivers, the rustle of the leaves across the top of the forest when the wind blows, for the city hears at a distance. The key of middle F on the piano is the tone that musicians, physicists and Tibetan Buddhists consider to be the actual tone of nature. I thought this was quite incredible, the fact that there was a, they pinned it down to a key, you know, that was, that was actually audible. I don't know if anybody's read the, the, Celef the Celestine prophecy, and I believe he, he called it the hum, you know, and that was the same, a very similar thing. There is a distinct difference, we are told, between the bonds and dugpas or red caps, the sorcerers, and the yellow caps, the eastern lamas. To avoid the influences of the brothers of the shadow, the candidate is asked, Hast thou attuned thy being to humanity's great pain, O candidate for light? If this is confirmed, then they are advised that they may enter, but first be aware of the pitfalls on the way. The first gate, Dana, through which we pass, is open as a result of charity, love and tender mercy. At the second gate, the steep, the rocky path, we are warned against fear. Fear, O oh disciple, kills the will and stays all action. Dosh, a weapon used by divas or angels in the protection of of men against evil. The secret for man is to develop the power of viragya, dispassion and absolute indifference to pain and pleasure in the universe. So this is throwing the similarity to the, the doge, the weapon used by the divas. When all selfish thoughts have been renounced by the pilgrim, we are ready for the fourth, the portal of temptation. Temptations that attempt to ensnare the inner man. The one who follows in the footsteps of his pre predecessors is Tagata, the Buddha. We are reminded that the only real permanence is in a liar, the liar. The crystal ray or light is all that there is within this lower body of clay. The temptations that beat us on the fourth path are from Mara or illusion. The jealous Lamayin are elementals and evil spirits, adversaries of man. This is the portal of the abyss where if we are not of gold, cheer and daring to cross its shores, we will be swallowed. The Holy Isle is the higher self. Once we have crossed the portal and built a high wall around that self with a moat, we are protected from pride and satisfaction. A sense of pride could be the unfolding of the work that has been done. Maya's ocean Swallowing, swallow up the pilgrim and the isle, even when we think we're clear. 
the isle and the hounds are used allegorically as the serene self being pursued by the hounds, the dark forces. The deer should pursue its path steadfastly to reach its goal before the hounds. The goal is the veil of refuge, otherwise known as the path of pure knowledge. Jananmarga, literally, the path of Janan or of pure knowledge, Sanskrit, Svasam Vedana, self analyzing reflection. The diamond soul, the strength of the, uh, the diamond stone, is used as an allegory in this context to be used against the snares of self. Having reached this stage, we find that the first further gates are open, moving nearer to the mastership of the sevenfold path. The fixedness of mind that not even a breeze can waft an earthly thought within. There is a sense that as one should lose his way along the path, madness could ensue. We are advised to fight on, don't lose courage, return to fight again. The fearless warrior faces up to the temptations beset him, ambition, anger, hatred and desire. The Virya gate, the fifth of the seven portals. Titiksha, the state impervious to pleasure or pain. A master of the day, here, day meant manvantra. Mount Sumeru, sometimes shortened to Meru, is the sacred mountain of the gods. The waters, the wisdom, should not become stagnant. The three worlds are the terrestrial, astral and spiritual. Alaya, the root or essence of the universal soul. The guardian wall of protection, yogis, adepts, saints and nimanakayas have contrib contributed to the strengthening of this protective wall around humanity. Klesha, the enjoyment of worldly things, desires, whether good or evil. Related to this is Tana. The desire or will to live is what draws us back to further incarnations. Compassion, in the abstract sense, is impersonal law or absolute harmony. My Alba, our Earth, the hell of the esoteric school. There is no place called hell. It is a state, a vici, not a locality. The keys to the seven portals, the seven windows that lead us to enlightenment. One, Dana, the key of charity and love immortal. To Sila, the key of harmony in word and act, the key that counterbalances the cause and effect and leaves no further room for calming action. Kashanti, patience, sweet, that naught can ruffle. 4. Virag, indifference to pleasure and to pain, illusion conquered, truth on alone perceived. Virya, the dauntless energy that fights its way to the sup supernal truth out of the mire of the lies terrestrial. <coughs> Six, Payana, whose golden gate once opened leads to Naljo, the adult, toward the realm of Sat, eternal, and its ceaseless contemplation. Seven, Prajna, the key to which makes of man a god, creating him in a bodhisattva, son of the Jyanis, Jayan Koans, lords of meditation. Joy Mills again from the inner and outer transformation. So in inner and outer tra inner transformation, earlier we spoke of right action, the application of which leads to inner, then outer transformation. Joy Mills, in her book, From Inner to Outer Transformation, writes, In speaking of right action, 
we noted the necessity to move from an inner centre, from that stable centre which is the true self. We have emphasised that for that kind of movement, a genuine transformation of consciousness is required. Such a transformation, of course, is dependent upon the choices we make daily, choices that ultimately become the one choice of the path we are to take, the bodhisattvic path, as the voice of the silence calls it. To be in this conscious state is to be awake, what in today's parlance we might call mindfulness, practice diligently. Once we internalize the knowledge and goals of the path, the center needs to express itself and the next stage is external transformation. So external transformation. Once we have explored our psychological internal nature and once we are awake, we are ready for that transformation to be pushed outwards, something that not only affects the individual, but is at the root of transformation of society. Clearly stated by Joy Mills, one of the great mysteries is that individual unique transformation is achieved by the individual, but by that achievement, the whole is transformed. All humanity is transformed. The externalizing of the inner awareness, gained through awakening, is put into action. Joy Mills points out that the choice of the path we will take, the conscious choice of the path that is called the bodhisattvic way, gives direction to all our actions and brings about an inner transformation in which there is a kind of reversal of the normal or usual mode of action. In the world. In all the great scriptures of the world, certainly in the voice of the silence and in the Bhagavad Gita, as well as in so many other sacred texts, such a reversal is called for if the individual is to fulfill his human obligation. And that was on page 80. In my final statement on from inner to outer transformation, I'd like to share Joy Mill's comment when she states, In fact, when there is a genuine transformation within, an outer transformation takes place, for we perceive the world in a new way. In the voice of the silence, we are again reminded that the Bodhisattva way is when the pilgrim hath returned back from the outer shore a new saviour of mankind is born. He will lead men to final nirvana. At the beginning of the talk, I used a quotation by N. Sri Ram. I think it is fitting that I complete the talk with a final quote from him. Spiritual living is a fulfilment from moment to moment in which the outer person is in a state of living, rapport, with the inner being and becomes an extension thereof. Thank you for listening. Peace to all beings.